There are times that they may slip up. Well, no, there are times that they may slip up. Well, no, we'll get it right. There are times that they may slip up. Well, no, we'll get it right. Guarantee I'll be on top when it's game said. There are times that. There are times that they may slip up, we'll always get it right Guarantee I'll be on top when it's game said life Get up and show up, don't ever lose your fight You watching me from the couch, at least I say I tried A long time ago, someone said this stuck with me Passion with that action will only remain a dream Keep positive, motivated people on your team Cause other negativity can kill your self-esteem Believing is powerful, but sadly so is doubt So you can choose which way you wanna go, which route The mind that controls the body can beat anybody and gotta be all in, don't treat your dreams like a hobby And if you practice on your day off, won't have an off day Talent alone won't get you there, still got a long way Gotta take big risks and big steps to strive Wanna be the winner when it's game set live Whoa Oh, that's right. I'm going to try to be as loud as possible here. We are coming from Collision in Toronto, and I'm with the legend himself, another Hall of Famer, and we're bringing on another Hall of Famer of Game Set Life, the incredible Hall of Fame tennis coach, Rick Macy. Good to see you here at Game Set Life. Oh, glad to be here. Actually, I kind of had a sore throat a few days ago, and I was a little sick, but at the end of the day, Game Set Life rolls on. Dave and Rick. You got it, man. And when you're feeling a little under the weather, are you still on the court at 5 a.m.? Are you still in your daily activities or do you modify or, or adapt it because you're not feeling well? No, I stayed right on course. It's just that there's a lot of people here from the Nadal Academy, a lot of pictures, a lot of hugging and stuff like that. And that night I got a sore throat, but uh, I'm still hanging tough. Like I thought of you the other day because I – had an Alka Seltzer, okay, to feel better, and I thought of Dave Meltzer. So uh, I'm glad to get you live and in color on Tuesday afternoon. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I uh, wanted to name one of my kids Alka, and my wife nixed it. And uh, we won't even tell you what the middle name was uh, when we were talking about the Alka Meltzer uh, game set life naming rights. But speaking of tough guys, uh, this is one of my favorite people on earth. We became friends a few years ago. Every time I'm with Forrest Griffin, it is uh, just a joy. I The man is as authentic as they come. He's going to tell you, tell you it as it is. Um, and he is a mentally, physically, spiritually tough human being. He doesn't give himself enough credit. Uh, I'll tell you that because he's much wiser uh, than you would think uh, the UFC legend, Hall of Fame fighter is but let's bring on the incredible forrest griffin what's happening guys thank you for having me <laughs> Dave, rick, my man. as always rick honor to meet you my friend no no honor to meet you you can well, tell in- i really i really cleaned up for this really you know <laughs> thank I, you i'm coming straight off the mats i was actually doing a little uh you know thing with the unlv basketball team i was teaching them some MMA stuff this morning. So coming straight from the mats. That's sweet. Well, you're great on the mats and great off the mats. Now I'm, I got a treat for you for us. The real reason I wanted to come uh, you to come on this show, cause you've been on every show. You're the uh, highlight of my day. Like you I said, know that I am an expert on tennis. <laughs> yes, exactly. It, it was, it's the Nadal Academy, but Rick has the best yeah. introduction. So they're called the common threads and he mirrors you and the best tennis players in the world, and of course, the Alka Meltzer himself. So, Rick, I'm going to hand it over. Give us the common threads to introduce Forrest Griffin to the show. All right, Forrest, here we go. Number one, the ultimate fighter, crowd exciter, quick hands and feet, body parts meet, FG, hard to beat. Serena Williams, ultimate Compton Street fight, day and night, out of sight, no stage fright, Serena, record books, she rewrite. David, the ultimate Buckeye igniter, okay? Audience gets excited. Epic bell nighter, okay? David, okay, everybody's brother like no other. Number two, the octagon was your home. Love to roam, mouth foam, did the Evans, Georgia dance. Opponents had zero chance. Williams sisters, Octagon was their court. M&A and tennis 
similar sport, okay? They bop and weave, boy oh boy, did they believe. David's octagon is a unique ring. His messages have unreal sting. They cling, negativity fling, DM, cha-ching, cha-ching. Number three, okay? You had a deep burning desire, a true forest fire, okay? Chokehold like pliers, lightning punch, solid crunch, say goodnight, out to lunch. Serena had a Compton rage, center court was her stage, opponents couldn't gauge, volleys had punch, okay, short balls, she'd munch, queen of England many times had brunch, okay, Akron's favorite at a young age, okay, had a financial rampage, jail, almost his cage, now a delicious wage, okay, on stage, creating a new page. And number four, the last one, December 28th, 2022, a fight at night, out of sight, ratings through the roof, Griff, bulletproof, Mr. Bonner, a goner, UFC was a mystery, FG changed history. Serena brought the fight, strokes had bite, opponents shiver, okay, they couldn't deliver, she smooths over the river, nobody forgive her. And the last one, DM had pit bull fight at night, a beacon of light, okay, a white knight, okay, was the richest and the poorest, game set life, welcomes the ultimate fighter, one and only worth. Okay. Wow, thank you for having me. That's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> It's my favorite part of my day. And Rick, you put the effort in and it pays off as always. Speaking for us of putting the effort in, you know, people see the UFC where it is today. And I see this in baseball, football, boxing, but especially in the UFC uh, because it is still uh, the fastest and I think biggest sport in the world uh, that uh, started in the backyards uh, with some grit and some grime. And if it wasn't for the cornerstones like you, and we just lost, for example, Jim Brown uh, in football, you know, people don't know that these guys are making $1,500, $5,800 a season, you know, and I want to take us back, uh, steal a page out of Rick's book, but, you know, talking about the progress, give me a little bit of perspective of where UFC has come from compared to the multi-billion dollar entertainment entity that it is today. Sure thing. Well do. But the first thing I have to mention is that Jim Brown was a commentator for, I think, three or four UFCs. So wow. he, he commentated the early UFCs and um, he's got a famous line. Don't you bet against no Gracie. Uh, the other guys were saying, well, you know, he's whatever. And, and Jim Brown, <laughs> Jim Brown actually sold on jujitsu at the time. And this is in the mid 90s. So good for Jim Brown, um, you know legend but what a great guy um so yeah the ufc you know it started kind of 1993 it was actually meant to be a one-off like hey let's just find out who the toughest guy around is and you had all these different martial arts and we thought well well they thought what if we you know what if we found what the best martial art was well the best martial art was jujitsu at the time it turned out um, hoist one and then you know jujitsu was kind of dominating at the time and karate and boxing and muay thai and kickboxing they they all realized man that jujitsu stuff we got to learn that so so the game evolved right everybody took notes from one another and instead of a competition of martial arts it was like who can come up with the best combination of martial arts right so a little of this a little of that well i need some wrestling i could can't be taken down. I need some knees, elbows in the clinch. All right. Well, I need some of those sweet foot trips from uh, the Muay Thai, you know, and, and now you, you really take the best of each fighting art and it's become its own art. Now, as far as the, the econ economic impact, um, the best thing I've ever done in life, Dave, is be a true believer and be sold on the sport. As you know, huge basketball and football fan growing up, but then I found fighting and I said, man, that's what it is about. So the, what I've done right uh, is basically just be an early adopter. You know, it was like I, I got in on Apple when it was a dollar stock or something. That's pretty much how I ended up here. But um, no, you know, it, it, it kept, it said, man, there's, there's, 
there's some growth for this. There's something to this. People want to see who the best fighter in the world is. You know, you think about boxing, right? It had been around for years and everybody, who's the best, who's the heavyweight champion of the world? Everybody knew Tyson, Ali, you know, Frazier. Everybody knew those guys, right? Evander Holyfield, the Klitschko's. So that was like the toughest guy in the world. And then these guys said, yeah, but they can't wrestle. They would, they would get crushed if they fought a good wrestler. And they said, you know, well, that they're not the toughest guys in the world. Let's find out who that is. And we believe we can market that to everybody, you know, because everybody kind of cares about, let's be honest, you're walking down the street, you kind of size a guy up, you say, who's the toughest guy around, you know? Who's okay, you get this guy, right? And so that's kind of what we all do. And then, you know, they, they provided a way to find out. And here's the thing. There is, uh, I believe, and, you know, they don't ask my opinion about these things, but MMA has a saturation point, right? At the end of the day, only so many people are going to be into fighting, you know? Only so many people are into, you know, uh, golf, right? But there's a saturation point. But what the UFC has going for it is that that saturation point, we're only talking about America, Canada, Brazil, a couple places where it's already at. That there's a whole international expansion for the sport of fighting. And then the other thing that happens is now, and, and I, I'm going to credit Ronda Rousey with a lot of this. Now I see average Joes, like little kids, 12, 13 year olds. I see them training mixed martial arts and they're going to be fans of the sport. Why? Because I still can watch football and basketball because I played in high school. Was I any good? Not really, but I can appreciate how amazing the NFL game is or the NBA is because I have a frame of reference. I played for like, you know, 10, 12 years of my life in middle school and high school. Right. So I know what they're doing. Well, all these kids that are training, they're not all going to be the next John Jones. Some of them. Well, so again, you got, you got a larger base to draw from, but even if you have this base and it cycles up to UFC champions, all these people will move forward as fans. You know, and, and that's that's where the sport's going. You know, you start you start with the TikTokers, right? You start with those generations and, you, and then you kind of build, you build market share. And again, you, you talk about Endeavor, right? They're pretty smart. They, they kept the fights going. They only had nine weeks down. And I know because everybody talks about the year of COVID. Well, for me, it was a nine week break of COVID. And I was back in and I was working my butt off <laughs> after nine weeks. You know, we were we were grinding putting on fights there's no other sports going well hey what guess what fighting at the end of the day it's about three people in the octagon one of them can wear a mask and two people outside that's that's really all you need you know you get four or five people together that's your team and you can provide you know you you can fight right so again they they did a great job of keeping it going great group market share yeah so amazing rick no, no, that's awesome. Let me, uh, Horace, let me back the truck up. Go back in time. Tell everybody, security guard, no insurance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How you, try, how you tried out, ultimate fighter, and the rest is history. Take it from yeah. there. Yeah, so, you know, I, I started training um, when I was actually in the police academy. So I went, um, I served back my contract. You had to work X amount of time where you had to pay for it. So I served that back, and I said, man, I got to take the chance. I had an opportunity to fight in South Africa, but it was over like the holidays and I, I didn't have seniority. So I just quit my job because um, I wanted to take that fight in South Africa. Took that fight in South Africa, destroyed my right shoulder. So dislocated my arm, still ended up winning the fight, but I destroyed my right arm. I came back. Um, I got the free surgery because I was still a student. So I got the free surgery, which was worth everything I paid for it, which was nothing. And my shoulder was never quite right, but that's all right. I had a little money. I was okay. I had like some retirement money, whatever. Um, I cashed in my 401 from, from when I'd had a jobby job. And then I, you know, trained them, training. Well, two weeks out of a big fight, maybe three weeks, I shattered these two metacarpals. Now, I don't know how um, people, people think that insurance is kind of magic. You just show up at the emergency room. So I do show up at the emergency room and, um, you know, kind of like, indigent care right and they're like uh yeah yeah we'll, we'll put you in a, a cast but we're not going to do surgery if you have no money or insurance and i was like oh oops so you know yeah so i did uh what i did was what you always do when you're in trouble i committed a felony yeah that was true um so i took out student loans 
I withdrew from classes. I took the money and I bought myself a new hand. It was a good investment, but technically I guess you, you can't do that. It's actually a felony. So I bought myself a new hand. I was going back. I was doing all right. I got a call from the UFC matchmaker at the time and he gave me some odd advice. He said, don't lose. I was like, well, that's a, that's a weird thing to do. But you know, I was going to fight in March, but I had to, I mean, I had to make money and I wanted to fight. So I was fighting down in Brazil in, um, in uh december so in that fight i broke my arm and i got a little bump here so i had i had a fracture i broke my ulna uh and it was an elephant non-union meaning it didn't it didn't join back and uh, again i went in they say you need a, a plate put in here so oh boy and um, i had a really cool emergency room doctor and he just would like put the cast on tight um, and then finally i got an opportunity to get a law enforcement job and i kind of given up right i'd had three or four tough breaks, literally, not figuratively, literally tough breaks. Um, you know, I was fighting for thousands of dollars. I was living on my coach's couch. Um, yeah, thank you to those guys in the hardcore gym. They were amazing. I would have, uh, without that support team, I would have quit many times over. And my parents, of course. Um, yeah, that was basically like just, you know, that 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 leech that <laughs> hangs out, runs beginner classes, and, you know, is mooching off you. But anyway, so I said, all right. I finally got uh, a job. The first job I got in law enforcement, super easy. The second one, um, it was really hard to get a job. Um, and uh, I kept failing polygraphs and psychologicals, but that's another story. Uh, and, and I remember there's like a physical component to it. And I cut my cast off that day to go do the physical portion of it. I did the physical. I passed. I got the job. I'm working. And I get a call back from the UFC about 10 months later. And they say, hey, we're doing this Ultimate Fighter show. Um, you know, we had your name on a list. Do you want to be a last minute replacement? You got 17 days notice. Somebody had failed a drug test or something. And they were like, hey, have you ever seen a reality show? And I was like, I think I've seen the real world. And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's like that, but with fighters. I'd never like, I'd seen like two episodes of the real world. And so I had no idea what I was getting myself into. But but the the deal was, Randy Couture and Chuck Liddell were the coaches and they guaranteed me that. And I wanted to learn from those guys. So I took a chance. I quit my job. I'd only been working there for like 10 or 11 months. Now I was still on probation. And if you quit still on probation, you were not eligible for rehire. So I was taking a big chance. So this is the second time I quit a jobby job to, to go pursue my dream. I'm like, what are you doing, man? This is crazy. So I get to the airport. And I immediately call my lieutenant and I change my mind and I say, hey, hold on. Can I still. Can I still. See, I'm saving energy with that. Can I still, um, you know, come back to my job? He says, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, probably. Sorry. Well, hold on. Let me call. I call a guy named Amet, who is a producer from the show that had been kind of talking me on. And he says, hold on hold on, you got to do this. We need you. Basically they needed 16 people because you can't have a, you can't have a, you know, competition with odd numbers. And I'd already said I'd do it and I'd already passed like the medical stuff. And um, so, you know, I talked to Dana White. First time I've ever talked to the guy, right? This is 2004. I couldn't hear a word he was saying. I'm in the Atlanta airport and all I'm hearing is static. And he gave the best speech, the best motivational speech ever. I didn't hear a word of it. Uh, all I heard was <laughs> like you're in the title, like uh, faucet running. And um, anyway, I just decided, you know, I'd rather regret in life the things I do than the things I don't do. I got on the plane. I won the ultimate fighter. That was big for me because that was the first time when I won the ultimate fighter that I was like, it's real. My job is now to get as good at fighting as I can. I don't have to bounce. I don't have to do construction. I don't have to teach beginner classes. I don't have to work. You know, my, my job is to become a professional fighter. And I had put all my stuff in storage. And um, I was, you know, you don't get paid until the show actually airs. So you didn't get paid when you do the show. You got, so I lost all my cool stuff in storage. So the, the moral of the story is if you're ever watching those Storage Wars shows, um, let me know if you see all my cool crap. I love it. All right, last question for us. Uh, you know, the mindset of athletes today, because they get paid so much, has to be different. But when I'm watching the fights, especially with my boy Michael Chandler, who, as you know, is not only a close friend, but 
absolutely is one tough mofo. Do you see a difference in the octagon? I mean, obviously there's difference in training and development. I've been to your performance center. You got all kinds of nutrition and shots and whatever else you do, you comb the hair and the massage, the eyebrows. But when they get into the ring, it's, you know, to me, they seem just as tough as they've ever been. Do you see a difference in the toughness of the athlete today uh, in the ring uh, as you did when you, you started? Not at all. And I'm going to tell you why, because it is the ultimate meritocracy, right? If you lose two or three fights in a row, you're not a professional fighter anymore. You know, it, it's it, you got to think those guys on the teams that are number 54, five and six, those guys are working. Everybody in the UFC, unless you're, you know, one of the guys with 10, 15, 20 fights, that's what you are. That's the way you start out. You know, you might not be here tomorrow. The other thing is winning pays a lot better than losing. So, you know, yeah, I see people, um, you know, I, I, I see guys that are guys and gals at that bottom level that are very hungry. They want that boom. They want they want the paycheck. They want the bonus. They want, you know, they don't want just want the show money. You get paid to show, but then you get a win bonus on top of that. They want that. And here's what I see. Um, you give you give a fighter a million bucks. And they say that was cool. But, you know, it'd be real cool. Two million bucks, you know there's there's a mentality right like why not go for it all so and not everybody has that mentality and honestly i think unless those people are just amazingly physically gifted they wash out pretty quick because this, this is a hard sport there's there's easier ways to make money yeah, oh Dave, tr tr trust me <laughs> yeah, that force this is like really important obviously all sports especially when you got in your mma or boxing, people just think you go in there, you know, and you're you're fighting a guy. Can you elaborate anything about visualization, watching video, the technical part, the skill part, and the artistic part of this? Because I don't think people appreciate that part of it in something so physical. Yeah, it's funny. Creativity is actually one of the things that comfort and creativity. It's the comfort in a fight that allows you to be creative. How did you get comfortable? You did it a thousand times. You, you've put yourself in that situation many times. So that's actually something like one of the one of the tenets we look at for for you know fighters. Are they creative in there? Do they think um, kind of non-linearly, which in our sport is a great thing. So for me personally, um, I was blessed to have gotten to train a couple of years with Randy Couture, and he was, um, you know, he was kind of introducing introducing us all or indoctrinating us into that mental side, mental side of the game. Cause I didn't really believe in it. Honestly, I thought if you needed like a sports psychologist or you needed to talk to somebody about fighting in a dark room, maybe you don't like fighting enough. Maybe you should go get a jobby job type job. I was, I was, uh, but I was a hundred percent wrong. I was a hundred percent wrong. Like you're talking about, um, you know, visualization, understanding how you're going to feel on that day. And then that rehearsal, right? So I call it away games. So you want to go spar in a gym where people are not friendly. You're going in there with your team on enemy territory for a, a rough day at the office. So I used to do this inadvertently. I used to drive to Atlanta from Athens two hours to spar with world champions when I was, um, you know, almost a mediocre boxer, but not quite. And every day I was driving a real beater of a car. I would drive down and I wouldn't say it out loud, but in my head, I would allow myself to think. And I tried not to. God, I hope if my car breaks down, it breaks down on the way there, not the way back. You know, because I, I don't have to go get beat up and the drive break down on the way back. Um, but, but you know, I tell you what, I got in actual fights and they weren't much different than those away games, you know. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've, I've lost some big fights in front of millions of people. And I was uh, I was on the first pay-per-view ever to do over a million buys. And uh, I cried in it. And I wasn't like, I wasn't that upset about it because I didn't quit on myself. My body quits on me. It happens. I made a stupid mistake. I knew I could fix that mistake. Um, you know, and I knew that that I put the work in. I knew in my heart of hearts that I hadn't let myself down. And, and so what, what I always tell guys is, look, every day you're going to step on the mat. And why are you stepping on the mat? Look, you're having fun. You're learning something. You're doing something. You're drilling. But you have to try to get the most out of that practice because that practice today is where you're going to drive the confidence for your fight. And maybe that practice is just about learning some technical skills. And we're just doing something which kind of seems boring. Well, we have to push in and dig in harder to that, right? 
like just just working on step right backhand or stuff, you know, whatever. And and we have to push in on that because that is where we're going to have the the confidence on our sparring day. And our sparring day is going to give us the confidence for our fight. And that's that's kind of the ladder up effect. And I don't even mean confidence. You know, you do something enough, you get better at doing it. Right. So if you carry the weight, the stress of competition with you at every practice, it gets lighter until you barely feel it. You know, and it's just like, oh, it's just something I carry, you know, like like body fat. Right. You, you get it on. You don't realize it's there. Gradually accumulates. <laughs> Well, I will tell you, you have a jobby job here anytime you want. What an incredible talent you are on and behind the camera uh, as we see you more and more in that uh, respect. So please keep us in mind all the time. You are an incredible interview, but also uh, you have a career in entertainment. There's no doubt about it, my friend. Keep up the great work. Don't discount the jobby jobs that pay a lot of cash. They also are very good. Uh, come back and join me soon, my brother. If you're passionate about your job, your job bless you, right? <laughs> you got it. Oh, he canceled him out. Anyway, Rick, uh, we are here at Collision in Toronto. A quick takeaway of the day. Let's share with everyone some of the guidance, wisdom, and perspective of being with a great like Forrest, Gr Forrest Griffin. Well, I think anybody that saw that, if they didn't know the introduction or what he did, you would have never thought, okay, that he was the ultimate fighter and he had the success that he had. But it just goes to show you, when you get into the ring, okay, you can flip that switch. And I think that's important for everybody to have balance in their lives because what a complete individual. I love that guy. He had me laughing the whole time. Yeah, man, there's no better interview. I love a guy who can ask two questions and let him run for half an hour. And he's <laughs> giving lessons and stories, laughter and love. Uh, that's what Forrest Griffin's about. My takeaway is simply the authenticity as i said during the introduction like like he does not give a shit what you think he is who he is and he brings it every day uh and i love the story about him being a felon uh that was one of my favorite parts of the story taking his student loans to pay for his, his new hand uh there's so many great stories so much wisdom that you share as well i just want to give you a big shout out and thank you for your patience we're working all over the world together and uh, we are trying to find from planes, trains, automobiles, uh, we got game, set, life with Hall of Famer, Rick Macy. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. All right. See you next Tuesday, Dave. You got it, brother. Take care of the incredible Rick Macy, everyone. Remember, we're here at Collision. We're premiering Office Hours uh, tomorrow night. Uh, office Hours tomorrow night uh, here in Toronto. Come and join us. If you're not here around, we got meetups, we got masterclass, we got mentorship, we got speeches, we got interviews. All you got to do is swing by david at dmelter.com. Remember, though, most importantly, be more interested than interesting. Be kind to your future self and do good deeds. Hit it, Nick. There are times that I may slip up, we'll always get it right. Guarantee I'll be on top when it's game said life. Get up and show up, don't ever lose your fight. You watching me from the couch, at least I say I tried. A long time ago, someone said this stuck with me. Passion with that action will only remain a dream. Keep positive, motivated people on your team. Cause other negativity can kill your self-esteem. Believing is powerful, but sadly so is doubt. So you can choose which way you want to go, which route. The mind that controls the body can beat anybody. And gotta be all in, don't treat your dreams like a hobby. And if you practice on your day off, won't have an off day. Talent alone won't get you there, still got a long way. Gotta take big risks and big steps to strive. Wanna be the winner when it's game set live. Whoa.